Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to Grandview Reformed Church. I would like to start out today with uh, asking if there's any new announcements that weren't in the bulletin. Anybody have anything that uh, needs to be added? If not, just want a reminder that we have a Sunday school beginning uh, 15 minutes after church ends. We try to get going about 10, 15, and there will be catechism tonight. Uh, we start off with a call to worship. If you turn in your bulletin, we'll be reading from Psalm 138. I will praise you, O Lord, with all my heart. Before the gods, I will sing your praise. When I called, you answered me. You made me bold and stout-hearted. May they sing of the ways of the Lord, for the glory of the Lord is great. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the anger of my foes, with your right hand you save me. Okay, we'll start by singing hymn number 210. I ask that you remain standing as we say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven. Let's take a minute and greet those around you.
All stars say, find the way at the sound of your great name. All condemned feel no shame at the sound of your great name. Every fear has no the sound of your great name. The enemy, he has to leave at the sound of your great name. Jesus, worthy is the Lamb that was slain for us. The Son of God and man Turn in your bulletins one more time. There's a prayer of confession that we will say together. We need to confess, God of Abraham and Lazarus, how often we are not content with the simple gifts and lives you offer. Tempted by everything, we can be calm and sensitive to those who have nothing surged by the world to accumulate more 
together in goodness and godliness, chasing after all we have not the energy to pursue the faith, the love, the gentleness you have for us. Forgive us, God, of reversal. You have sent the one who speaks the words we need to listen to, to have life. Help us remember how you have redeemed us. In remembering, now and forever. Amen. Now we'll have some special music by Miriam. Sometimes you win some, sometimes you lose some. And right now, right now I'm losing bad. I stood on the stage night after night, reminding the broken it'll be alright. But right now.
you, Marion. Uh, we're going to have our congregational prayer now, but before I begin, I was just wondering if anybody has any updates on the people who are listed in the bulletin. I had heard that Marie has had her surgery and that she was doing well. Anybody heard anything more beyond that? There's some talk that she might even be able to be home sometime soon. Um, and also, uh, I had asked, and they said that Nan is now able to walk without her cane and is doing better, but uh, I didn't hear much more from anyone else. Okay, let's go to prayer. Lord, you know all, all of our needs before we bring them to you, but you ask that we do present them to you so that we can see how it is that you've already arranged to answer them. And with that in mind, Lord, we just ask that you would help us to see your hand at work, uh, help us to see uh, healing coming to the, the bodies, the, the aches, the illnesses for all the people that uh, we have listed here in our church. Lord, we thank you that Marie was able to get in and have her surgery early. And uh, Lord, we pray that uh, you will continue to help her to be able to come back and join us. Uh, Lord, we thank you also that Nan is uh, recovering. <clears throat> Lord, we ask that you be with Harold Leonard. Um, touch them in such a way that they know that you're in control. Rich and Ella Rice, with Roke, with Marion, that all these people can feel your hand, Lord. Lord, we ask for healing, but more than that, we ask that they would feel your presence. Lord, we ask the same thing for, for our country. Lord, every time we turn on the news, we see new news of people fighting about one thing or another, and uh, it seems like it will not end. And Lord, I know that your word says that if we humble ourselves, turn to you in prayer, that you heal our land. And we ask that, Lord. I also know that that requires repentance. So Lord, I ask that you reach out to your people here in, in America. Help us to see how it is that we can turn back to you. Uh, turn away from the things that were mentioned in the, the group prayer, group confession. That we would seek you and not more possessions and more things. Lord, we ask that you heal our hearts, turn our hearts back towards you, and heal our land. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> ask that you stand with me now as we sing hymn number 147.
You may be seated. Today I'll be reading from the book of Amos, and I'm going to go out on a limb and guess that that's not something you've all been reading a lot of lately. <clears throat> you can tell by the names of my children and by the, the verses that I typically pick for the sermons that I have an affection for a lot of the books of the Old Testament that we often don't go to a lot. And so with that in mind, I have one of my favorite passages from the Old Testament is Amos chapter 7, verses 10 to 17. Uh, let's read, read together. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent a message to Jeroboam, king of Israel. Amos is raising a conspiracy against you in the very heart of Israel. The Lord cannot bear, the land cannot bear all his words. This is what Amos is saying. Jeroboam will die by the sword, and Israel will surely go into exile, away from their native land. Then Amaziah said to Amos, Get out, you seer. Go back to the land of Judah. Earn your bread there and do your prophesying there. Don't prophesy anymore at Bethel, because this is the king's sanctuary and the temple of the kingdom. Amos answered Amaziah, I was neither a prophet nor a prophet's son, but I was a shepherd, and I also took care of sycamore fig trees. But the Lord took me from tending the flock and said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. Now then, hear the word of the Lord. You say, do not prophesy against Israel, and stop pre preaching against the house of Isaac. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. Your wife will become a prostitute in the city, and your sons and daughters will fall by the sword. Your land will be measured and divided up, and you yourself will die in a pagan country. And Israel will certainly go into exile, away from their native land. Now, having read that, you may wonder, why would I say that's one of my favorite passages? Because it's kind of a strange one to have as your favorite. The part I like is verse 14 where he says, Amos answered Amaziah, I was neither a prophet nor a prophet's son, but I was a shepherd and I also took care of sycamore fig trees. If you look in the Bible, you will see that time and time again, God calls the strangest people to do the strangest thing. We think about Moses being a prince of Egypt, but we forget that after being a prince of Egypt, he spent 40 years taking care of sheep. And in that time, he lost his self-confidence because when God calls him back, he really didn't want to go because he didn't like speaking in front of people. Uh, David is the youngest boy in the family, and in that culture at that time, that would be the least honorable position for a boy to be. He's the one that God said, I want him to be king, and he would be the greatest king. Now you have Amos. <clears throat> I've always been fascinated by this phrase, and if you look in different translations of the Bible, uh, different versions will translate it differently. There's a very specific Hebrew word that they use where it says, I took care of sycamore fig trees. Uh, some versions will translate it as, I picked the fig trees uh, of the sycamore tree. I picked the figs of the sycamore tree. Others will say, I pricked the sycamore figs. Um, in preparing for this, I did what probably lots of uh, preachers do. I went and listened to a Chuck Swindoll sermon on Amos because he has covered everything. And I had heard a version that I had never heard before. Apparently this particular fig uh, was not especially good. Figs are real sweet. They're not real popular around here because they don't grow around here. But uh, they're very sweet, uh, very good for you, lots of medicinal value. Uh, people who are fasting have found that figs are excellent for uh, when you break a fast, they're good for calming your stomach. Uh, they taste like candy. Uh, you can dry them out, and you can have it uh, year-round. Uh, but the sycamore fig was special. Uh, one version that I read said that uh, you had to uh, pop the pod of the sycamore fig in order for it to be fermented. Otherwise, the, the fig pod, it grows in a, it, think of it kind of like peas in a pod. If you didn't uh, pierce it, it wouldn't have peas inside. The, uh, excuse me, the berries inside wouldn't get fermented. Uh, another version that I read said that they had to do that so that it wouldn't become hard. Uh, and uh, Chuck Swindoll said that what he, had, what he had read and studied was that you had to pierce it so that you could drain it out and then take it, mash it up, and then that's what you dried and sold. There are lots of different kinds of figs. In the Middle East, figs are very popular. Uh, they said they taste like candy. Uh, but this is the least popular one. This is the one that poor people would eat. This would be a treat for poor people. Um, the thing I think of is when I was a kid, 
my grandma always had candy, and she would give us candy. One of her favorite candies was whorehound candy. Have you had this? You like this? The reason why I think of it is because it's, it's, it's supposed to be good for you. I have a, you probably noticed I have a, a bad throat this week. I've had a head cold all week. I could barely speak yesterday. So lucky for you, uh, it's healed enough that I can talk today. But this whorehound candy is supposed to be good for your throat. It's supposed to be good for cleaning your sinuses. I remember that when I was about my kid's age, when I had it the first time, I spit it out. I was like, yuck, why would you eat that, Grandma? Because it tasted like medicine. Um, this sort of thing is in every culture. Where, what is it? Because whorehound became a popular candy in the U.S. during the Great Depression. Because it was cheap. In almost every culture, you have these sorts of things that what is a, uh, a luxury for a poor person is often not even desired by somebody who has more wealth because you can have something better. So Amos was a hillbilly who took care of sheep in one of the most remote, uh, least populated areas of Israel. He's from a, a man from Tekoa. Uh, in my mind, when I think of that, I don't know if you guys have dr ever driven much in northwest South Dakota or Wyoming. Uh, I'm going antelope hunting next, uh, next weekend or the weekend after out by Sorum. Have you heard of Sorum? It's not really a town anymore. There's a camp there for hunting, but that's about it. A good friend of mine from college, they own land all around that area, and so they'll put their address to Sorum. Their post office is in the next biggest place, which is Riva. You heard of Riva? It's just a post office. It's a post office and a store. But if you go either direction, there's no town for, I think it's 30 or 40 miles east or 30 or 40 miles west. Um, but that still wouldn't be as remote as Tekoa. Uh, in this era, you just didn't leave. These people would live their entire life without ever leaving more than 10 miles from where they grew up. If he's a shepherd, he would probably go with the flock seasonally, so he maybe moved a little bit more, but he wouldn't leave. And then his job was, he took care of the sheep, and then during the times of the year where he could make more money, he did this little process to get any sycamore fig trees ready to go. We don't know how old he was. Uh, Amos just shows up. Uh, most people believe that he was the first of the, of, the, of the prophets to show up in this era of the prophets. Uh, during the time of King David, uh, Nathan was a prophet. There's other mention of other people before that. But when you start looking at the, the, the great prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, um, these came along much later. Amos is believed to be one of the first ones. He would have been living at roughly the same time as Jonah, uh, probably the same time as Isaiah. Um, God had other choices. So why does God look down and say, I want this guy who takes care of sheep and picks figs to take my message? The other part you have to understand from the geography is, he's from Judah. <coughs> At this particular time, the Jeroboam that they're talking about is Jeroboam II, who was a king of Israel, uh, would have been in the uh, late 8th century B.C. So remember, B.C., you're counting backwards. So about 780 to 750 B.C., somewhere around then. Um, if that doesn't mean much to you, that would be the time of Homer, who wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey. Uh, it would be roughly the time that uh, Egypt was down and had, hadn't come back up yet again. There weren't many places in the world where things were going really good at this time. But at this particular moment, Israel was at the height of its power, uh, the greatest it had been since the days of David and Solomon. But Judah was that part of, Ju of Israel that had broken away. When Solomon had died, his son had become king, and most of Israel broke away from his rule. Uh, his son was Rehoboam. Rehoboam ruled over Judah and Benjamin, which Judah was a fairly large area. Benjamin was very small, a very small tribe. The rest of the tribes of Israel went with Jeroboam the first. And he was not a very godly man. And generally from that time on, you can read a pattern in the Bible where what keeps happening is uh, God uh, looks down, sees that they're sinful, sends somebody to warn them, you guys are being sinful. Most of the time they don't listen, so bad things happen. Bad things happen. They look back to God and say, God, we have sinned. Uh, we repent. We turn back to you. They turn back to God. God would bless them. After they had gotten used to living uh, a good life, their kids or their kids' kids would go back, and it just kept happening. And Jeroboam II comes along about 100, 150 years later, 
And at that time, uh, the last time I spoke, I talked about uh, when Elisha was in Dothan. Well, when Elisha was in Dothan, the king of Syria, which was then called Aram, had come down and surrounded him because they were the great power in the neighborhood. Jeroboam II had conquered Syria. Um, this is a time period where they had the greatest expanse of land that they controlled between the time of King David and, uh, and uh, King Solomon and the present day. So, not only did God call a shepherd and a fig picker to go and take his message, but to the people of Israel, he's basically a backwards cousin. He's kind of a foreigner. So imagine that today, somebody from the most remote parts of Canada decides that they have a message and goes to New York City and Washington, D.C. and begins preaching. And the message is not very pleasant. Basically, God's going to destroy you. Uh, if you look at the words here, um, you can understand why the king and the priest would be a little annoyed with Amos. Your wife will become a prostitute in the city. Your sons and daughters will fall by the sword. Your land will be measured and divided up, and you yourself will die in a pagan country. And Israel will certainly go into exile away from their native land. He meant that literally, and it happened. One of the things that often happens that people who are, like, I, I want to say a real pastor, a full-time pastor, a guy whose job it is to basically bring God's word to people, one of the problems with that position is you often have to bring bad news. People don't like to hear, yeah, okay, your life is pretty comfortable right now. Things are going pretty well. Uh, but God says you've kind of forgotten about him and you're living a life of sin and he knows what you're doing when no one's looking and if you don't stop it, it's going to end and it's going to be pretty ugly. Nobody wants to hear that. At any time in history, that has never been a popular message. If you look prophet after prophet, God calls these guys to do this. If you look at uh, some of the other ones, Jeremiah has a wonderful passage where he says, uh, the Lord has given me these words which were at first sweet in my mouth, and then when I swallowed them, they turned bitter. And if you read the context, what he's saying is, imagine the privilege, the honor, and just the awe of realizing God is speaking to you, and he has a message for you. This is what Jeremiah meant when he said it was sweet in his mouth. But then you realize, but the message I have to give is not going to be very well received. We're familiar with the story of Jonah, which, like I said, was at roughly the same time. Um, Jonah didn't mind the idea of Nineveh being destroyed. If you remember that story, Jonah doesn't want to go to Nineveh because he's scared. He's like, I know God, and if God wants me to go there and preach to him, then they're going to repent, and then he's going to save them, and I don't want them. I want them to destroy Nineveh. This is a different situation. Judah and Israel are the same people who are separated by basically a fake border. Not, not that different from North and South Korea today, by the way. Um, you have a situation where he's being called to go to his own people and tell them, God says you're going to be destroyed. If you read the context, there is no way that these guys enjoyed what they were saying. And can you imagine what would be the response if, I mean, you see sometimes these people on TV who have these big placards that say something like, the end is near, repent. Um, if you stand in the middle of New York City and start telling people you're living a life of sin, God's going to destroy you, your wife is going to be a prostitute, your children are going to be killed in the streets, and you're going to die in a pagan land. A, they'd laugh at you, or B, they'd let you have it. That's what's happening, and that's what keeps happening. And God keeps calling these sorts of people. He keeps calling shepherds and fig pickers to be the guy to go tell the people you need to change your way. When you look at Israel at that time, this is the best it had ever been. If you look at the timeline, Jeroboam II was roughly the same amount of time from, his, from when Israel had split to America's founding till now. If you look around America today, we are wealthy. Now, you may not feel personally wealthy. My wife and I have more bills than we have paychecks, but we... we we're not hurting for things. Uh, even the poor in America 
usually have a car. Even the poor in America usually have air conditioning. Even the poor in America usually have a closet full of clothes. Poor in this era meant you had one set of clothes. I used to talk about this when I would teach uh, uh, my world history class. What the Industrial Revolution did for health is often o under overlooked. We think about all the advances in medicine and all these other things, but two of the things that did more than anything else to make people more healthy, first, they had more food. The second was they all of a sudden had extra clothing, which meant they could wash their clothes. Imagine living your life with one pair of clothing that the only way you can wash it is you're going to be naked. The best uh, bath day and, and laundry day would be the same day. We're talking about that kind of level of poverty, but not in Israel, not at this time. Israel is doing okay. In Israel, uh, if you look back, let's turn back a little bit to uh, chapter 5. In Amos, chapter 5. There's a, a whole long, this is before where uh, Amos says this to the priest Amaziah. There's this long tirade that he's giving of all of these things that are upsetting God that they're doing. And some of them may not make sense to you. Uh, in the middle of all this, he says in verse 11, You trample on the poor and force him to give you grain. Therefore, though you have built stone mansions, you will not live in them. Though you have planted lush vineyards, you will not drink their wine. For I know how many are your offenses and how great your sins. You oppress the righteous and take bribes, and you deprive the poor of the justice in the court. Therefore, the prudent man keeps quiet in such times, for the times are evil. Seek good, not evil, that you may live. Then the Lord God Almighty will be with you just as you, just as you say he is. Uh, jump ahead to verse 21. I hate, I despise your religious feasts. He's talking about people who think they're serving him. Imagine if I came into a church today and said this to the congregation referring to their worship. I, I do not mean to apply this to us here. I don't feel that way. I'm saying as a whole, coming into a congregation and saying this, that is the context of the message. I hate, I despise, this is God speaking through Amos. I hate, I despise your religious feasts. I cannot stand your assemblies. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs, I will not listen to the music of your harps, but let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never-failing stream. Did you bring me sacrifices and offerings 40 years in the desert, O house of Israel? You have lifted up the shrine of your king, the pedestal of your idols, the star of your God, which you made for yourselves. Therefore, I will send you into exile beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose, God, whose name is God Almighty. <clears throat> what does he mean? I think in America, it is very convenient and can even be comfortable to get into the habit of, I go to church on Sunday morning, maybe go to Bible study during the week, uh, my kids are in Sunday school. I do all these things that outwardly are things that you would expect of somebody who is have a vibrant living faith with God. But it is entirely possible to do all those things and to be dead on the inside. Amos is speaking to an entire nation that's living like that. They still have religious services. They still bring offerings. They still make their sacrifices. They play the music. And God says, you don't mean it. And I know the difference. I have blessed you and you are wealthy and you have thought that because you're wealthy, you will give back some of these things that I've given to you, and I'll let you have more. And it doesn't work like that. You have trampled on the poor. You have oppressed those who have no power. Uh, elsewhere, in many of the prophets, they talk repeatedly about how you've ignored the widow and the orphan. If you want to see the sign of a people who love and serve God, they take care of these sorts of people. In different communities, it looks different. Uh, I'm teaching down in Marty now. I love being there. If I look at what are the issues in Marty, it's different than what are the issues in Armour. But the question you have to ask is, is are, are we as a church reaching out to those people that need us? When you look at uh, the people around you, if you are a, a deacon or an elder on Sunday morning, but your neighbor's hurting and you do nothing to help them, 
which does God care more about? If you look at the, the sorts of sins that are common to a, a wealthy society, um, it's almost always greed. Uh, my wife will tell you, I would love to have a boat. And if I had a boat, I'd want a bigger boat, probably more boat. Uh, there's no end to this, and we will always want more. If you look at your house, you always want something that's a little bit nicer, a little bit better. But it doesn't make you happy. If you are content with the things you have, God will provide whatever you need. But if you're not content with what you have, it doesn't matter what you get. Uh, we have, I mean, every year we have living illustrations of people who have made millions of dollars who end up bankrupt and often killing themselves because it doesn't buy happiness. And if you look around you, uh, you'll see that even in armor, we, we have the same habits. We're no different. But hopefully we, we're turning back to God. Hopefully, in our hearts, we're still putting God first, and we can recognize that the blessings come from him. The blessings aren't God. But one last thought to just look at this. The two places, I, I, if you've never read the book of Amos, I encourage you to read it, because the first part starts out where he goes and starts telling about how God is going to destroy all the areas around Israel. And I imagine that the people hearing that were like, okay, good. We don't like them. He said, okay, and also Judah. That would be, you know, they're evil twin brother. Okay, good. And then he lets them have it. <clears throat> you can take a couple things away from that that I think that are, are not good. One is you can get this idea that God is just angry and that God just wants to punish everybody. That's not what's going on. The standard that he holds up is to those who haven't been given the message that I've given to you, I'm still going to hold them accountable for their sin. But for you who have received my message and you still trample on the poor, you're going to get it worse. This makes me fear for America. If you understand how God has blessed us, whatever people want to say about America as an exceptional nation, we have more wealth than the rest of the world, almost combined. The average American has a home, more than one automobile, something like three or four televisions. If you pick the middle guy, what do we do with it? When you look at the people in the country who are hurting, what's often the case, by the way, in America, some of the poorest people in the country, there's almost always they're poor because. Made bad choices, made whatever. But are we doing anything to help them? So I want to just share real quick a couple of stories about a couple Amoses that I've met in my life that have changed my life just by having a conversation with them. Uh, the first uh, is in... Uh, Kabul, 2005, I was working in Kabul, and a girl who was a seventh grader at the time was just this delightful girl. She was a really good student, was always smiling, was unbelievably cheerful, and appropriately, her name was Joy, Joy Schumacher. When I introduced myself to the class on the first day of school, I said that I was originally from South Dakota, and she perked up, and, I, and uh, after the class, she said, my dad's from South Dakota. I said, oh, really, what part? Uh, he was from Eureka. I said, was your mom from South Dakota, too? She said, no, she's from Colorado. And uh, so she said, you got to meet him. you got to meet him. So later on, I did. Owen Schumacher grew up in Eureka, South Dakota. His wife, Debbie, is from, uh, I can't remember which suburb area of Denver, but from Colorado. <coughs> they met, uh, got married. He had gotten an engineering degree from SDSU, and I liked him anyway. I didn't hold that against him, because you can go to SDSU and be a good person. Uh, he later got another degree from Iowa State. He worked for John Deere, where he helped design, uh, I can't remember if it was the hydraulics for the agricultural implements or something similar, but this would have been in the era of uh, uh, late 80s, 90s. He was doing that kind of work, so whatever would have been cutting-edge John Deere equipment at the time, he was working on it. He felt called by God to give it up. Now, I don't know what that paid, but my guess is it's better than a teaching salary. He and his wife gave it up, and they moved to Kabul, Afghanistan. I've never asked Debbie this, but I've always wanted to. How did you know? Because it's one thing for your husband to come home and say, I think we should, you know, give up this nice job as an engineer and go move to Kabul, Afghanistan, which in the 1990s was even worse than it is now. And though Debbie said, yeah, let's do it. And it wasn't just them. They took their kids. 
And just to make it more ridiculous, they're all blonde-haired, blue-eyed kids with skin as white as you can imagine running around in a country where you can't hide those sorts of things, that they would just stick out. I don't want to say a sore thumb because it would be whatever a healthy thumb looks like because really good-looking kids. But that's a problem because they're foreigners and those kids are now in danger. So Owen Schumacher, Debbie Schumacher, moved to Kabul and he's like, okay, now what am I going to do here? He ends up working for a ministry that goes up into the mountains in Afghanistan and brings electricity to places that have never had it. Some place early on, he figured out that what they were doing, he could design something better. And so he designed a little turbine this big that you could put into a mountain stream and would provide enough electricity to give uh, light for 50 houses. His design. He took it to a Chinese company and said, you can sell it, you can have my patent, as long as you sell it to us at cost. And I don't remember what the cost was, but it was just a few dollars. So he would take this turbine, he'd go up into the mountains, he would show them how to build a, a, a dam, a spillway, the traces, a powerhouse. They had to build it. And then he would show them how to maintain this turbine. He would bring the wire, show them how to hook up the wire, and then it was their responsibility to keep it going. And when the turbine uh, died, it had, I don't know what the life expectancy was, they had to be setting aside money for the next one. People went from the Stone Age to satellite TV overnight. They had never had power. Now the first thing they bought was light bulbs and light. Second thing they bought, television. That's what happens when God calls an Amos. He had an amazing ministry. Everywhere we went, first of all, he learned every language. Everywhere you went, he was, I don't know how many he knew or not, but everywhere we went, he was, I didn't. I was there three years. I could, the greeting takes about two minutes. I couldn't get the greeting down. But he, he was able to speak with anybody he had contact with, was just an amazing human being. And I think his wife, the more, uh, the longer I've been married, I'm more impressed with the wife that she went along with it because I can't imagine how she would agree to it. So that's one. The other one, 1993, I was in inner city Chicago. <clears throat> I had gone there to work with a ministry that did uh, all sorts of programs working with poor people in inner city Chicago. And it was at that time that I first was introduced to this passage in Amos. And they talked about that. They said, you know, if people are, if, if a guy is a drug addict and he's poor, uh, it's one thing to say, well, it's by his choice. It's another thing to look God in the eye and say, God, I couldn't help him because it was his choice. We had all these ministries that were working with all these people in different areas, and they would send us out to different ones. The one that was most wanted was in the west side of Chicago in a community called North Lawndale. Uh, I was looking online. It is once again one of the most violent places in America. But they had a church that got started there, and it got started by a soccer coach. Uh, he had gone to Wheaton, became a coach in uh, inner city Chicago, had Bible studies, realized that there was a need for a church. His wife moved into that neighborhood, one of the roughest neighborhoods there. First week they were living there, their house got broken into, everything stolen. And once again, he had to explain to his wife, I'm pretty sure we're supposed to be here. And once again, the wife somehow said, I, I don't know about this, but I'll go along with it. Uh, fast forward 15, 20 years later, they built up a church, they built up a medical center, because one of the needs that they had was they had no place to go for a doctor, and so they have a medical center where if you can't afford it, they will have you do cleaning, but you, you'll do something for the medical care. Uh, they had a huge basketball court that was also their church service area, and that was where they would have uh, a summer league. I go to the, uh, that, I get sent to that ministry to do a summer learning program. While there, I met the pastor who uh, was now the serving pastor. His name was Kerry Casey. He hears, I'm from South Dakota. Is you from South Dakota? Yeah. You need to talk to Larry Marshall. I said, why is that? He's from South Dakota too. Like, okay. So uh, they had invited us to come play at their league games. Uh, I think it was a Wednesday night. So I went there. Uh, interestingly, I never actually played. They didn't want to draft a white guy to play. So I sat on the bench and talked to the only other white guy, Larry Marshall. And uh, we were chatting, and I said, I, I was told I should ask you about your life story. What can you tell me? He's like, oh, I don't know. It's no big deal. And I said, well, well what happened? I heard you were in Africa. So yeah, I said, I was supposed to ask you how that happened. He said, well, I was a farmer in Hitchcock, South Dakota. One Sunday in church, this group came in and talked about the mission field in West Africa, in Sierra Leone, Liberia, other countries. He said, the next day I was out uh, um, cultivating. Been in the late 70s. So 
I'm cultivating in the tractor, and about 8, 9 in the morning, I feel that God's feeling this burden on my heart, saying, you need to sell your farm, everything you own, and go move to Sierra Leone. <clears throat> he's like, I laughed it off. Because by noon, I was like, I'm pretty sure God's saying that. So over noon, he said, all right, God, tell you what, if you want me to sell the family farm, all of our farm equipment, and move to Sierra Leone in Africa, I'll do it on one condition. Guess what? You've got to convince my wife. He eats his lunch, goes back to work, end of the day, goes home, comes in the house, and uh, the wife looks a little bit frazzled, a little bit tired. She goes, we need to talk. He goes, yeah, we need to talk. She's like, no, you don't understand. We really need to talk. He's like, I don't think you know what I'm going to say. She looks him in the eye and says, you want to sell the family farm and all the equipment and move to Sierra Leone in Africa. His jaw drops. He goes to the preacher, tells the preacher. The preacher says, this just sounds crazy but I'll check with the missions board. I think that they were Methodists. So he checks with the Methodist uh, missions board, and they said, is he a pastor? No. Does he have any uh, training as a missionary? No. Did he ever go to any school for any special training at all? He said, no, I'm just a farmer. He said, well, I, I don't know what we would do with you over there, but we'll, we'll check. They call back the next day and said, I think we have a need for you. We just got a call from our mission agency in Sierra Leone they said that a whole bunch of farm equipment had just been donated and they don't have anybody that knows how to run it and they want to start teaching the locals how to use it so they can be self-supporting. So he moved to Africa. And that's where he started his ministry. While in Africa, he planted churches, built schools, drilled wells, all kinds of farming projects. He eventually felt God calling him to go to inner city Chicago, which is where I met him. And when I met him and had this conversation, uh, he said, I, I actually think God's calling me to go back to Pine Ridge now. I said, well, why do you think God would do that? He goes, well, growing up in South Dakota, I sometimes think that we need to leave South Dakota to come back to see it as a mission field. And so he said, I think that I went, I went to Sierra Leone so that I would be ready for inner city Chicago. And now in inner city Chicago, he worked with drug and alcohol addiction. He's like, now I think I'm ready to go back to Pine Ridge. I thought it was a wonderful story. And I, I remember, I had one conversation with this man. And that would be in 1993, so it's 24 years ago. Everything I'm telling you is from one conversation. I can remember almost everything he said. I couldn't remember much more. I couldn't remember his first name. I had to look it up. I remember, oh, wait, his son was a really good football player. His son went and played at the University of Colorado. I'm a Nebraska fan, so I forgave him. But he was at, he was at Colorado in the late 90s, so I found his son. I used his son's name to figure out his dad's name. I sent a message to the son to say, I'd like to get a hold of your dad. I haven't talked to him for 24 years, blah, blah, blah. Before the son writes back, I find an obituary.